Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm going to be the compere for tonight. Um, my name is Mahendra Mahay, and I manage a project at the British Library called British Library Labs. Bit of a plug there. Um, what we're trying to do is get researchers, artists, entrepreneurs, educators, and anyone else interested to experiment with the library's digital collections. We do this through an annual competition where we choose two ideas of what people want to do with our digital materials, and then we work with them, and then we do creative things with them. So, for example, tonight is an output of that. We also have awards that celebrate those who have already done fantastic things, fantastic and creative things with our digital collections, and finally, we work on collaborative projects. Our project is one of the sponsors for tonight's event, but the second sponsor is the Eccles Centre for American Studies, uh, which was set up to, to promote the British Library's North American collections and to support American studies in schools and universities. Little plug for them, there's a fantastic related event on Friday the 14th of October. It's called A New History of Abolition and it's going to be in the same location here. So, um, I'm here to introduce the evening. So if I could get the slide up. Okay, so... Uh, so in a few minutes, uh, Hannah Rose Murray, a PhD, a PhD researcher from the University of Nottingham, and one of the finalists of this year's labs competition, will talk about her research and how this relates to tonight's performance. Uh, Hannah then will introduce the main part of the show, and Joe Williams and Martel Edinburgh um, will bring some history back to life with a performances, performance focusing on the truly incredible story of Ellen and William Craft. In the final session, about 8.30, uh, Hannah, Joe, and Martel will take questions from the audience. Uh, please note, um, the whole evening is going to be filmed, and the performance contains some strong language from the time, from the 19th century. Okay, so over to Hannah. Good evening everyone, um, I'm Hannah Rose and before we get started I just want to um, share with you a little bit about my research and my PhD which focuses on African American abolitionists in the 19th century, so specifically um, black men and women who travelled to Britain between the 1830s and the 1890s. So the really amazing thing about this history is that Frederick Douglass, for example, one of the most famous, or if not the most famous African American in the 19th century, and other black abolitionists like William and Ellen Craft, visited the UK and spent several months, or in the Craft's case, uh, several years in the UK. And they lectured all across the country. So the really cool thing is that we unknowably and inevitably walk past sites where these men and women lectured, um, they're just r rich, really, um, in the history of um, Black Britain. So this map that I've got on the screen which just shows you some of the locations where Frederick Douglass lectured. And it's a little bit of a crude map, but um, it shows you the length and breadth of where he travelled. So big cities like London and Manchester and Leeds, but also small villages um, and you know, tiny, tiny fishing villages as well. And similarly, some of the other abolitionists as well. So these men and women travelled to uh, tiny villages like on the Isle of Wight, for example, where they would have spoken in churches or meeting halls. Um, and again, to sort of the largest city, really. So it's a really important and really interesting history that we need to know more about because, as I say, you know, walking around London or um, perhaps some of the cities where you, know, you have friends or you were born, um, you know, these, these men and women would have spoken in a number of venues that are particularly still remain today. And the really interesting thing is my research is basically looking at the newspapers from the 19th century to really analyse um, not only their reception in the UK, but also to analyse their performances and their speeches. You know, I want to um, sort of reveal these men and women and actually um, hear their own voices. I want to speak, you know, let them speak for themselves. Okay? And... The really interesting thing is um, the British press um, has you know, completely reported on these men and women around the country, from 
um, tiny, tiny regional newspapers, again, to um, newspapers like the Times and the Leeds Times and the Manchester and Examiner and all of the big newspapers and all the weekly newspapers as well. And it's really, it's really exciting because we can learn so much about these men and women. Um, for example, another uh, black abolitionist I look at called Josiah Henson, he actually met Queen Victoria. He was actually invited to Windsor Palace to um, meet with the Queen in 1877. And he wasn't the only abolitionist to do so. Okay, which, and again, it's this, this sort of history that we need to know a lot more about. So, as um, Hendra said, I'm very lucky to be one of the finalists in the British Library uh, Labs competition this year. And the, um, the Labs project basically uses digital collections in um, sort of different and exciting ways. And my project with the Labs team is basically based on my, on my PhD. So, we're using the digitised newspaper collections to uncover I mean, these hidden black voices in the archive, uh, to search for individuals, their speeches, uh, letters as well, um, all published or um, spoken by people of African descent from the 1830s to the 1890s. So, this idea of finding hidden voices is really the key part of the project. And if you've ever used the digitised newspaper collection or if you've done a search using the British Library, if you type in, for example, Frederick Douglass, uh, this is what you would get. You would get a newspaper article or an advert with um, the name uh, highlighted. Um, but what's really interesting is that through the newspapers and through that um, electronic collection, we can analyse, obviously, um, the responses um, in the British press and we can see all of these different examples um, where Douglas um, spoke, or William and Alan Craft spoke, for example. But really, that's only a small percentage of perhaps some of the newspaper articles that mention these individuals. So part of the, part of the project was actually trying to harness the power of technology, really, and using machine learning, which is not something I'm well-versed in, but I'm learning. Um, and that involves teaching the computer, basically, to um, how to find certain things. And obviously, the certain thing that we want to find um, is abolitionist speeches. So basically, using technology to try and make that search a lot more accurate and to try and um, find more speeches um, from Frederick Douglass or William and Alan Craft that perhaps we haven't seen before. Okay, so it's a way of making that search more accurate and obviously a lot faster as well. So before I introduce the performance, I just want to give a really brief introduction to William and Alan Craft. And they are really sort of two of the most fascinating and, and courageous individuals, really. Um, and they were part of an abolitionist network that they travelled to Britain and they stayed here for several years. And they were born enslaved in Georgia. And Ellen worked as a house servant and she married William. And technically by law in the southern states where slavery existed, um, slave marriages were not technically legal. And... As a result, they were determined to escape, um, finally actually escaping in 1848, because they were fearful that their master would sell them separately, um, sell them further south, and they also didn't want their children to become slaves. And they devised a really ingenious escape plan. Ellen would pose as a white gentleman with William as her manservant, and they would uh, catch a series of trains up to the northern states where slavery didn't exist at that time. So you might think, how is this possible? Um, but Ellen, who you can see on the right, dressed in uh, man's clothing, um, she was actually quite fair-skinned. And that was, that was a result of her mother's rape by her master, the plantation owner. So Ellen could pass for a white person, um, but she couldn't read or write, as it was forbidden to teach slaves to read um, or write. She cut her hair and bought men's clothing. And they also planned their escape around Christmas time, because um, some slaves were given a few days off. So it was a good time, potentially, to escape, as they might not be, uh, or their absence might not be noticed for a couple of days. So just to stress, this was an incredibly dangerous thing to do. If caught, both William and Ellen would have been abused, tortured, and almost certainly separated to different, separated, sorry, to different parts of the South, never to see each other again. And it was a really huge risk, and it's a real testament to their bravery and their genius that they pulled it off. Particularly because when Ellen boarded the train, as was the custom, white people sat in a different carriage. So she was by herself in a compartment full of white people and slaveholders, going on a journey which she'd never gone on before. 
And at one point, she actually recognised um, one of these white people as a friend of her master, and she pretended to be deaf so that she wouldn't have to talk to them. And Ellen also had to completely ignore any insult or racism towards William and had to confidently withstand questioning about why she was bringing a slave up to the north. But they managed it. They managed to pull it off. And Ellen, a few um, years later, sort of reflecting on this experience, said, how we managed to travel the 1,000 miles between Florida and Philadelphia without being detected, sorry, Georgia and Philadelphia, without being detected, seems like a miracle. At all the principal hotels on the way, I was the invalid gentleman from the south, and at times I was compelled to sit at dinner tables and converse with men who had known me as a slave. Finally, however, after running great risks, we landed in Philadelphia with our hearts in our mouths. We were driven to the Coloured Hotel, then on Pine Street, and I shall never forget how surprised and perplexed the landlord looked when half an hour after our arrival, I came downstairs in women's garments. So William and Ellen settled in Boston for a short time, but legally there were still slaves in the eyes of the American government. So in 1850, the government passed a law called the Fugitive Slave Acts of 1850, which has been described by some historians as one of, if not the most under undemocratic law in US history. And this basically gave former slaveholders and slave catchers the power to travel from the south, where slavery existed, to the north, northern states, to drag former slaves back into slavery. And if anyone's seen 12 Years a Slave, um, obviously, um, sometimes these slave catchers wouldn't necessarily look for a former slave, um, as Solomon Northup in that film was obviously born free. Now, the crafts actually caught wind that slave catchers were looking for them, and they wanted to take a stand. Uh, William stayed with his friend Lewis Hayden in Boston, himself a former slave, and when the slave catchers arrived at their door, uh, William and Hayden loudly told the slave catchers that the door frame was lined with dynamite as both men were prepared to die rather than go back into slavery. So that should tell you something about William and obviously what he thought of slavery. But soon after that, it was decided that America wasn't safe enough for the crafts and abolitionists on both sides of the Atlantic raised money to send them to Britain, where they remained um, for many, many years. And in the early 1850s, William and Ellen um, spoke around the country and carefully constructed a performance during the mid-19th century, women, especially black women, weren't expected to speak in public. So what would happen is William would stand up and explain their escape, why slavery was a cruel system, and Ellen would sit quietly at the back of the stage, and when William had finished speaking, she would stand up and everybody would clap, and she would represent this symbol, this silent symbol of how brutal slavery was. People could see how fair-skinned she was, and the British audience's remark, how could anyone so white could be a slave? Which obviously tells us a lot about race at the time um, in the mid-19th century. And British audience was really fascinated by their incredible escape attempt. And uh, sometimes of the picture of Ellen, you see there on the right, was sold at meetings um, as well. And William and Ellen toured around the country because they wanted to make sure that British people actually knew how horrible slavery was in America. Because some people in the UK believe that not only slavery existed in this country, among some of the white working class communities or factories or something like that, white slavery, um, but also that um, black people were happy as slaves. And in one meeting, William frankly and very, very bluntly denied this. And it was reported that he said, William knew it had been said in this country that the slaves in America were happy, and that he denied. He was in slavery for four and 20 years, during which time he came in contact with hundreds and thousands of slaves, and he never met one that was contented and happy. God forbid that there should exist any in man's form so base, so low, so wretchedly degraded as to be content to drag out a miserable life in bondage for any tyrant on the face of the earth. So without, further, without any further ado, I want to introduce the performance. So please join me in welcoming to the stage Joe Williams performing as William Craft and Martel Edinburgh as Ellen. <laughs> 